Good day, my name is Nathan Diamond and I'm the Executive Director of the Orthodox Union Advocacy Center here in Washington. Thank you for joining us for this press conference ahead of a historic day in which the OU Advocacy Center and the Orthodox Union at large in partnership with the entire uh, American Jewish community is delivering 180,000 letters to President Biden at the White House this afternoon. Um, this campaign was just launched on Thursday of last week, and in that short period of time today, um, more than 180,000 people have signed these letters. And these letters essentially make three points, and we will have speakers here at the press conference to relate to each of these three points. One is we are asking the president to stand strong with Israel as it continues to prosecute its war against the evil Hamas terrorists. Number two, underscoring that we must do everything possible to free the hostages who have been held in absolutely unimaginable and horrendous conditions since October 7th. And number three, that with the surge of anti-Semitism that has come to the United States in the wake of October 7th, we are looking to the president and his administration and all authorities to do more to combat anti-Semitism and to keep Jews in the United States safe. There will be speakers this morning who relate to each of these topics, and the first will be Rabbi Moshe Hauer, the Executive Vice President of the Orthodox Union. Rabbi Hauer came to the OU several years ago to ascend our most senior professional position from a distinguished career as a congregational rabbi in Baltimore, Maryland, and has led the Orthodox Union in its myriad of programs with wisdom, with Torah-based values and drive, and was really the inspiration and the, uh, and the catalyst for the organization as a whole taking on this project and this initiative to gather 180,000 letters. And so without any further ado, Rabbi Moshe Hauer. Thank you, Nathan, for your critical leadership and your partnership. We are here today, today not to speak on behalf of anyone. We're not here to speak on behalf of American Jewry. We're here because American Jewry has spoken on behalf of itself. These boxes are real. They are not a stunt. They are not fake. They are filled with letters. I will admit there are only 100,000 letters here today because the White House is only allowing us to deliver that many today, but there are well more than another 80,000 in the pipeline that will be delivered. We are not pretending to speak on behalf of anybody. Hundreds of thousands of members of the American Jewish community have spoken on their own behalf. This is a community that has not failed to express its appreciation for the outstanding support of President Biden and the administration beginning on October 7th. We appreciate it. We appreciate it beyond words. We will never be tired of expressing, become tired of expressing that appreciation. But we need the President and his administration to do more. And that's why more than 180,000 people wrote these letters. Yesterday, the President expressed outrage and being outraged and heartbroken over an epic tragedy that occurred yesterday, the killing of seven aid workers from World Central Kitchen. We are also heartbroken. These are good people. These are good people who died trying to provide, trying to partner with Israel and trying to partner with humanity in providing humanitarian aid, needed humanitarian aid to the citizens of Gaza. That they died is indeed tragic. We are heartbroken over the tragedy the tragedy of people who fell under friendly fire. You know that at one point in this conflict, Sahal, the Israeli army, noted that 20% of the Israeli soldiers who had fallen in the conflict fell due to friendly fire. I believe since the end of January, that number is down, just like the number of civilian casualties in Gaza is significantly down. War is hell. It doesn't take place in a neat room where people make 
easy and targeted simple decisions. War is exceptionally hellish when it is specifically designed as it has been designed by Hamas to exact these kinds of consequences, these kinds of tragic, tragic results. So let's talk about our outrage, our outrage about the lack of moral clarity in this world around this conflict. And point out simply using this example of yesterday's tragedy over which we as well and Israel is heartbroken, point out three simple points. Number one, Israel sees what happened yesterday as a failure. They are investigating it. They have apologized for it. They're not interested in killing innocent civilians. They're not, certainly not interested in killing aid workers. An accident happened. Israel is grieving over it, it's investigating it, it's apologizing for it. Hamas is celebrating it. They're giving out candy. They say, mission accomplished. We got the Israelis to kill people delivering aid to Gaza. Look how terrible they look. It's interrupting the provision of aid to Palestinians. Who cares? The opposite. That's great for us. This was part of the war plan, the diabolical war plan of Hamas, who hates Israel so much and wants it removed from the face of the earth, that it has absolutely utter disregard for the Palestinian lives that Israel is risking its own soldiers' lives to spare. And a third note. If this was an act that was committed deliberately by a Palestinian inside Israel, not due to the fog of battle, but just by a bomb placed near a, the, the, the headquarters of the, of the most kind and generous organization giving of Jews giving to Israelis or to Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority, the moderate Palestinian Authority would name a public square after the person who did it. They would give their family a lifetime allowance forever. The lack of moral clarity is an outrage. Israel is the good, promoting life, defending itself and its citizens. A country has one priority. You know that if you have many priorities, you have none. They have one priority, and that priority is the protection of their citizens. The country that we speak of Israel also has values, and those values say that we're not the only people in the world, and we want to protect others to the extent that we can. We certainly don't want to harm them. We will work to refine our tactics so we won't harm anybody else, but our priority is the protection of our citizens. And that's what these letters come to express. Number one, they come to express that we are proud that the 180,000 plus American, Americans, Jews, and American friends of Israel are proud that there is a country in the Middle East that is living these values, that is expressing these values under the most dangerous circumstances. We are proud of the Israeli army. We are proud of them that when they make mistakes and when they fail, they look and they try to do better. We are outraged at those who will speak of them as they defend themselves every moment, criticizing them for mistakes and ignoring the thrust of what they're doing. We are proud of the good that refuses to be brought down by the evil that they are fighting existentially every moment of every day. We stand up and we want President Biden and the administration that has understood from day one the moral obligation of Israel to defend itself, to do everything to defend itself. We ask them and we want them continue to stand and to support Israel's right to prioritize 
the self-defense of its citizens. Israel will share with you concern for the Palestinian population. It will share with you the concern for the aid workers. But don't speak to them and don't speak of them as a nation and an army that doesn't share those values. Speak of them and continue to stand behind them morally and materially as you have to allow them and to encourage them and to strengthen them to protect themselves. Understand, Mr. President, that this is a domestic issue. It's not an international issue. Standing up morally for Israel is a domestic issue that is playing itself out on our streets and our university campuses. The more that people go and question and challenge and hold up the mistakes as if they are the values and downgrade the values of Hamas as if they are their mistakes, the more they feed the genocidal narrative, the chants, the rallies, the menacing, menacing rallies that are taking place in our streets and in our universities, promoting a distorted and false narrative against the one democracy, the one community of values, the one nation and army that picks up their guns only to defend themselves, that uses periods of quiet to advance science and technology and aid for hurricane and earthquake victims, as opposed to the other side that uses period of quiet, periods of quiet to commandeer concrete, sent to build homes and instead build miles of tunnels for the next option, the next opportunity to be able to kill. We have an anti-Semitism problem in the United States of America. And what the president and his admi administration say about Israel in this conflict is affecting it deeply. We need you, Mr. President. We need the administration to speak loudly and clearly. And finally, we are here today because this is the 180th day, 180th day of yet more than 130 hostages held. Men, women, children, very, very small children, innocent people whose lives we can't begin to imagine the hell of their lives or of their families, of their friends who wake up every morning if they slept thinking about what they are going through. I ask you, let's measure the amount of words dedicated to the humanitarian goals of society in the Israel-Gaza conflict since October 7th. How many of those words have spoken to the unambiguous, horrendous crime being committed against humanity in, this, in the case of the hostages? And how many have been sent on the world of ambiguity. Enough aid, not enough aid. We're trying, we're trying to get through. Are, is, the, is the aid going to Hamas? Is it not going to Hamas? The world needs to stop negotiating about hostages. They need to be demanding about hostages of Qatar, of Egypt. This can't go on. It doesn't, it's not a trade of three-year-olds and one-year-olds for convicted murderers who will be let out, prisoners of jail, to find the next opportunity to kill another hundred. We need to just say the world claiming the mantle of humanitarian compassion needs to speak absolutely, unambiguously. They have to end this now, unconditionally and totally. As we said, we're not speaking on behalf of anybody. Hundreds of thousands have spoken. This is what they feel. This is what we act of an ask of an administration whose support has been critical to us and which we appreciate to date. But it isn't over. And we need them to stay with us until it is until it ends favorably, until Israel finis finishes the job, until our students 
and our citizens, Jews and Muslims, and everybody in this country can, wi can, can walk and live without fear and until every hostage is home. Thank you. The Orthodox Union is, uh, at, as of its founding more than a century ago, an umbrella for synagogues around the country. And so many of the letters that were sent in were sent in through the orchestration of synagogues. Representing that segment of the community, I'd like to call up Rabbi Shai Schechter, a rabbi at the Young Israel of Woodmere, one of the largest OU shuls in New York State. He's, he is also a rabbinic advisor to the Orthodox Union's Yachad program. Um, and, and a leader in the community. Rabbi Schachter. Thank you, Nathan, and thank you, Rabbi Hauer, and the entire leadership of the Orthodox Union for your advocacy, for your leadership, and for allowing all of us across the country to partner together with you in this very important effort. We have all come to Washington, D.C. today for this urgent, critical, crucial, decisive moment. I would say it's probably an inflection point in modern Jewish history. The United States has always been and has always had an inflexible, unshakable, unwavering commitment, a bond, a relationship, a mutual commitment to one another, to the state of Israel, as was mentioned, the only democracy in the Middle East, after the entire world watched in horror on October 7th as the barbaric, savage, ruthless terrorists unleashed their wrath upon the people of Israel, upon the Jewish people as a whole, as a nation all over the world. The United States once again chose to side with good versus evil. The United States chose to take a very strong stand against the diabolical and outrageous evil of Hamas. These past few days, as members of our community have come together to advocate to have their voices heard, to write their letters and to share them with the President and his entire administration. To me and to all of us around the country, this has been inspiring, it has been encouraging, it has been something that I feel is extremely heartening. As we watch tens of thousands of members of our community, hundreds of thousands, young and old, teenagers, university students on campuses all across this country, mature adults who have be not become fatigued, 180 days has not made them slow down. They have been so acutely motivated to galvanize their voices with great passion, with deep concern regarding President Biden and his administration's current posture toward the existential threat and the ongoing war that we all face in Israel. We continue to trust in the righteousness of the Israeli army and their cause and in the moral conduct that they make sure to always follow in defending themselves as a nation and as a people. And we continue to have sleepless nights as we consider the horrifying and inhumane conditions of our innocent brothers and sisters who are being held hostage in Gaza for 180 days. So many of them are suffering, all of them living through this unimaginable hell, and a number of them American citizens who we should certainly care more about as we are the Americans who are trying to defend their best of interest. It is our hope that our president and his entire administration will remain loyal and committed to their strongest ally in the Middle East, which is the state of Israel and the people of Israel. And we hope that our president and his administration will do everything in their power to ensure the safety and the well-being of the democracy that shares the values that our great country exemplifies. Thank you. Of course, as the previous speakers noted, we are also marking not only 180 days of war, but 180 days of the captivity of the hostages. And we will have two speakers here um, representing uh, those, those who we think about every hour and every day. Um, first will be Mr. Maurice Schneider, who has traveled here. Um, he is the uncle of Shiri Bibas, um, who together with her husband and two small children were kidnapped on October 7th from Kibbutz near Oz. Shira and Yardane and their two sons, Ariel and Kfir, the little redheads that everyone has seen the pictures of and, and, and here they are with us. And I'd like to call up Maurice to please 
share what he can and share from his heart as we have all of the hostages on our minds today as we have for 180 days. It is, every time I, it's so hard to start what I want to say. If you have two hours to stay here, I will continue speaking. I can't do it. Whatever comes to my heart now, that's what I say. You cannot write your feelings. You cannot write what you feel. So you know who my family is. She is mother of my sister, and her husband, of course, you know, they were assassinated. Cold-blooded. They couldn't make, my sister could not make the walk to Gaza because there was, a, there was not a pickup truck to, to take it there since she was very ill. So she, did, she couldn't walk. So I said, okay, when the, you cannot go back to Israel, so we're gonna kill you right here so she got killed. That kind of people Hamas is. That's what I believe. I cannot see it any other way. Yossi could have done, her husband could have done the walk, but he stayed with her be, because of love. Fear, I'm gonna go from one to, one to another. Fear, turn one year old, underground. Millions of people celebrated his birthday, except him. Ariel, loved to dress as Batman. And in Purim, everybody in Central Park, and I know many others, we dress as, they, they read the Megillah, and it's, Hundreds, thousands of, hundreds of people were dressed as Batman, including me, and we went around Central Park. And I mentioned something that Ariel wrote. He wrote Batman in a picture. I'm sure that many of you have seen it. And then he, his Ganenet, his, his teacher, wrote what he told her to write. And he wrote, Ani af v'ni matzila nashim shebetoch bor. It means I fly and I save people that are stuck inside a pit. And I say, Ariel has more courage than any of the, it, everybody in the UN that has, not, has done nothing. They said, no, we can't do it. No, we don't have the power to do it. They told me that personally when I was at the UN meeting, just two weeks before that. The Red Cross, nothing. The UN, nothing. Ariel has more courage, more courage than those adults. He said it, he wrote it. He has more humanity in him, a four-year-old. If he can do it, adults in government have not been able to do. Rabbi Howard mentioned the people that got killed, the kitchen people that get killed. Yes, I feel sorry. Look at the headlights. Seven, eight people were killed by the Israelis. It's bad, of course it's bad. When was the last time we heard of any of our hostages? When? I have not heard of Shiri Ariel Okfir for 180 days. We don't even know if they're alive. We hope that they're alive. We pray that they're alive. We pray for their lives. We pray for their safety. But where is the world saying something, look, Look what Hamas is doing. Make a headlight. Put it in the news. Where are 180, 134 hostages? Say something about them. They don't deserve a line in the newspaper today, on the, the CNN, whatever. Why not? Are we less than they are, than the seven people that get killed? No, we're all the same. You talk about the seven people that got killed, about the Palestinians that got killed, they get killed all the time. Speak about these 134 hostages that are left. Something, a word, give us a word, give us a, a hope that some of them are alive. Every day could be that one of those hostages, not only my family, are dying. Can you imagine what they look like? They don't look like that, smiling. They don't look at, they don't wait that much. Those two babies don't deserve to be read books, to grow. Are they gonna come out of Gaza speaking Arabic instead of Hebrew? Nothing wrong with that. 
They don't have books to play, they, they, to read. My Shira doesn't have a book to, to read them. They don't have toys. Fear, learning to walk in the, on dirt. Ariel that cannot dress up Batman anymore. He said, I don't have the power to do it. One said a thing. I, I spoke yesterday in Albany too. And yes, Palestinians are getting killed because Hamas, the cowards of Hamas, they, get, they hide between Palestinians. And like the rabbis say, the more Palestinians die, is their victory. They give a worse, well, more people against Israel. Yes, kill as many Palestinians as you can. We're gonna hide behind them and you're gonna kill them. So then Israel gets more anti-Semitism. People, more people will hate Israel. And I tell all the group, there were more people in front of me. And this is Hamas. Any of you behind is a terrorist? Please raise your hand because you are the ones we're gonna go after. We're gonna go the way after. Are you Palestinians that Raise your hands if you are the good people. Any? Come on, raise your hand. They're even afraid to do that because they say they were good people. Hamas will get, take care of them too. That's how it is. It's reality. Are we dealing here with Hamas, a terror, terror organization? Who are they? I said that when people call them animals, Hamas, I got mad because an animal doesn't do what Hamas did, does or did. An animal kills to survive. Hamas kills for enjoyment, I think. They filmed it. For why? To show the world there, yeah, look what we can do. Who, they filmed the atrocities they were doing. That's the first time I saw Shiri holding the two kids because she they were filmed. Look at the price we got. Innocent people that were taken out of the cribs, out of their beds, in pajamas, maybe even naked, barefoot. And the lucky ones made it as hostages. The other ones were assassinated, cold-blooded, in terrible ways. And Hamas is a group that genocide, they call Israel that's doing genocide. If Hamas had not been stopped, they would have continued and continued and continued to Dimona and Bersheva and Tel Aviv. That was their purpose. That's genocide. That was their purpose, to, get, to, get, to kill as many as, as, as possible. I was in the Israeli army. And when I was trained, they told me, here's your rifle. And the purpose of this rifle to, to save the people that are behind you. When a terrorist is given a rifle, they tell him, here's a rifle, kill as many, peop as many people as you see in front of you. That's the difference between us and them. Goldenberry once said, if the jihadists, if the uh, terrorists, they will put their arms down, she was mentioning that, there will be peace on the world. We will live in peace. But if Israel put their hands down, they will be wiped out. That's the difference. We want peace. I lived in a country that want peace. I, I, I didn't teach my kids that an Arab is a bad person. In the Arab countries, they do. The Jews is a bad person. We see the pictures with them with suicide belts and everything else, and M16 at age five. I went to anti-Semitism big time. I belong to five generations of being persecuted because we're Jews, five. My Seide, as my grandfather, my mother, my generation, which is Margit, Shiri, and Fira and Ariel, five. I was just a month ago in a council meeting to, for a ceasefire, where they asked me to speak, and I spoke three minutes. It's so hard to say so much in three minutes, even to explain yourself. The other side came, they bring their opinion. And this person looks at me after what I have to say, and she said, October 7 was orchestrated by Israel. 
It did not happen. Can you believe it? In America, we hear that. What do you call that if it's not anti-Semitism? Israel defined three wars today, three wars, to get the hostages back, to get rid of Hamas, and to fight anti-Semitism, three wars. We say enough is enough was 179 days ago. One day was too much. We are suffering. We are, the whole Jewish world is suffering for what happened October 7. 7. And then I say to myself, when I mention I say suffer, I say shame on you. My suffering is zero next to what hostages are suffering. Zero. How come we say that we are suffering? Let's think of what they are suffering. That's, that's reality. That wasn't meant to be. They're civilians. They're babies. They're old people. They're mothers. Every time I see those beautiful pictures of women, I try to not think of what they're going through. And you heard enough. I don't need to bring it here. I don't. We're human beings when we understand the pain. Hamas is not. They're enjoying to see our pain. They're enjoying. The more we suffer, the more they're enjoying. I even said that they even, I am going to exaggerate as much as I want. That they're filming. They're filming for enjoyment and for training purposes. That's what I want to think. Why not? What is the reason you film something like that? The atrocities that they commit. To say, look how good we are. Look how brave we are. They're cowards. Come face the Israeli army. Come face me. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maurice, for joining us today. We also have by video a short message from Rachel Goldberg Polin. Um, Rabbi Hauer and I met her just a few days after the October 7th attack in Israel as she and her husband John were already suffering with the fact that their son Hirsch, who had been severely injured, was kidnapped on October 7th, and she's been a tenacious advocate for the hostages. Um, do we have the... Please turn... My name is Rachel, and I am the mother of Hirsch Goldberg Polin, who is a dual U.S. Israeli citizen. He is a civilian who was brutally kidnapped on October 7th after having his left arm blown off at the elbow while he was attending a music festival in the southern part of Israel. Every single party that is trying to help get these hostages free there are 134 hostages in total. They represent 25 different nations. They are Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists. They range in age from 14 months to 86 years old. They are grandfathers. They are fathers. They are spouses. They are brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters. And they all need to come home immediately. Every single person who is working in these negotiations has to lean in harder. Everyone has to compromise more. Everyone has to go to the furthest extent of pushing the leverage that they have on the parties that are involved to make sure that day 180 does not turn into day 280, 380, 480. This cannot be acceptable. It is a failure of the human species and we call upon our leaders our U.S. leaders, get our people out. We are on the brink of coming up on our holiday of Passover, which commemorates our leaving of Egypt, our leaving of being enslaved. I am asking you, let our people go. Let the human species go that is being held hostage in Gaza. We need you to do everything in your power. Godspeed to you and may you be successful immediately. Thank you.
Josh Joseph, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Orthodox Union, um, also leading our organization in all of these efforts, and uh, he will introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Nathan. Higher education. Spent a uh, good part of my life, over 10 years, studying to get degrees in higher education and then working in higher education for uh, about 17 years before I came to the Orthodox Union, where we have something called JLIC on campus, Yavna, 24 campuses in the United States and Canada where we have couples and another 70 total campuses where we have student leaders. Higher education. Those words mean something. They should mean something. This morning, I was wearing a little pin, a yellow pin, on my lapel. And I got to uh, the airport and a group of, I think, students who noticed and came over to me and asked what it was, and I explained that it's to commemorate the hostages. And one of them said, oh, I have to get myself one of those. So I took it off, and I gave it to him. That is the opposite of what so many of our students are feeling on campus. So many of them are feeling scared, are feeling not loved, not welcomed, not warmly uh, accepted for who they are on their campuses. To give us just a little taste, a little slice of that, I'd like to introduce one of our graduate students doing a master's at the University of Maryland, not too far from here, Karen Binyamin, to share a little bit of her experience. Good afternoon. I'm deeply honored to address you today as a proud first-generation American and college student. Next month, God willing, I will be the first in my family to earn a master's degree. Thank you. A testament to my grandparents' resilience. They were forcibly displaced from Iran and Poland, their homelands torn apart by anti-Semitism. Israel and the United States stood as beacons of hope, welcoming them when no other nation would. From my earliest years, I was instilled with a profound respect for my family's sacrifices, with education revered as the ultimate homage. School became my haven, where I could fully embrace the American dream unafforded to my ancestors. Yet, recent months have shattered this sanctuary. Seemingly overnight, college campuses nationwide have transformed into hotbeds of anti-Semitism, stripping away the safety and sanctity once cherished by myself and countless other Jewish students. The Overton window of discourse on college campuses has been steadily shrinking. Under the guise of tolerance, viewpoints deemed potentially offensive have been discarded. Publicly supporting Israel is unthinkable in most classrooms today. One might hope that any expansion of the Overton window would be to promote academic inquiry, nurturing lively exchanges. Yet, to our dismay, it is only widened enough to accommodate the singular purpose of harassing myself and other Jewish students. Throughout history, American college campuses haven't always embraced Jewish students with open arms. From discriminatory admission quotas to openly hostile learning environments, the people of the book have faced considerable hurdles in our pursuit of higher education. We had hoped such attitudes belonged to a bygone era. However, the campus zeitgeist has allowed anti-Semitism to resurface and penetrate the mainstream once again, this time taking the nefarious disguise of anti-Zionism. Since October 7th, Jewish students and I have weathered an unyielding storm of hostility and fear. Amidst the usual challenges of academic life, we've shouldered the additional burdens of grief, anxiety, and isolation. The chilling echoes of genocidal slogans like from the river to the sea and globalize the intifada reverberate regularly across our campuses. Justification for terrorism is shamelessly normalized. 
anti-Semitic BDS bills aren't merely proposed but often swiftly passed, while the physical safety of students is increasingly imperiled. Even more troubling is the complicity of certain faculty members who either turn a blind eye or actively engage in this reprehensible behavior. In student organizations, classrooms, and across social media platforms, our peers demand us to make a painful choice. Will you conform to our expectation of a good Jew, sacrificing your identity, denying your history, and renouncing everything that defines you? Or shall we smear you as a Zionist? Every day, my fellow Jewish students and I wrestle with troubling questions. Does the TA grading my papers harbor ill will toward me? Did my lab partner condone the atrocities of October 7th? Why have some of my non-Jewish friends abandoned me when I needed them most? Until this administration unequivocally declares that such attitudes are intolerable and stands strongly behind Israel, this climate of fear and uncertainty will continue to loom over us. We do not seek sympathy, empty promises, or token gestures of support. Mere pats on the back will no longer suffice. Mr. President, today I pose a crucial question to you. Do you wish to be remembered as the leader of an administration that presided over the resurgence of rampant anti-Semitism on college campuses? Do you wish to be remembered as the head of state that undermined a critical U.S. ally in its time of need? Do you wish to be remembered as the man who remained passive while American citizens suffered in captivity underground and college students faced harassment and assault for daring to speak on their behalf? The burden rests squarely on your shoulders to ensure that universities fulfill their duty to cultivate productive members of society rather than serve as breeding grounds for anti-Semitism that will inevitably spill over into the workplace. It falls to you to safeguard the American dream promised to my family and countless others. It is in your hands to foster the symbiotic relationship between the United States and Israel. We cannot afford to forget that we are not separate from history. We are actively shaping it at this very moment. The language and stances taken by your administration regarding Israel's actions in this war have given leeway to the anti-Semitic and anti-Israel rhetoric on campus. We ask only for moral clarity from a steadfast ally. We urge you to speak loudly and clearly about Israel's legitimate right to defend itself and denounce those who seek to delegitimize its actions and very existence. Throughout the ages, societies have often marginalized, expelled, or even massacred their Jewish populations. Few countries have been immune to the insidious virus of anti-Semitism. It is incumbent on you, Mr. President, to reverse this tide stand with Israel, and demonstrate that America stands as an exception to history. Thank you. Thank you so much. To introduce our final speaker, I would like to call up Rabbi Yaakov Glasser, the Managing Director at the Orthodox Union for Community Engagement. October 7th, does not represent the beginning of the history of anti-Semitism for the Jewish people, even in our contemporary era. Branya Brandman was born into a family of six children in Poland. She was just eight years old when World War II broke out and she and her family were confined in ghettos, enslaved in labor camps, deported and murdered. Miss Brandman narrowly escaped the gas chambers at Auschwitz by running away from her assigned line upon arrival and joining one of her sisters in another line. Her sisters soon developed typhus and the Nazis sent her to the gas chambers. Her parents and a brother also deported to Auschwitz, never to be heard from again. Ms. Brandman remained at Auschwitz until, April, until January 1945, when she was forced on a death march and though sick and delirious with fever. She survived until liberation by the American and Russian armies in May of 1945. Today, 
She is a retired public school teacher, volunteering her time as a member of the Speaker's Bureau at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. She actually spoke in our synagogue. A living memorial to the Holocaust, she wrote a beautiful letter to President Biden, and we are going to be hand delivering her letter to the President, along with all of the other boxes of letters this afternoon. Ms. Bram. Now here. Hello. Uh, I am going to read you a letter I wrote to President Biden. Dear President Biden, a most among my most treasured memories. Living in this great United States is the you spent over often on Holocaust Remembrance Day. Your commitment never forget the lessons of the Holocaust, which echoed the teachings of your father. Never stand by it in the face of evil. Was a bomb in my spirit. Thank you for standing up in support of Israel, both in word and action. On the scene, Immediately after the October 7 massacre, you sent a message of hope to the hostage families, and you have distributed arms to Israel throughout the war. Yet, once again, I now feel the same fear I felt as a child in Auschwitz, where Hitler murdered my family and my extended family. Thomas perpetrated an unthinkably horrific attack on defenseless Jewish men, women, children and babies, the most unprecedented sexual torture, mutilation, immolation, and much more since the Holocaust. Yet the world focuses on Israel's response, whitewashing, the barbaric massacre that prompted it. In World War II, the Allied powers stopped at nothing to the total elimination of the Nazi machine. And that is what the United States tried to do with ISIS. When Hamas trumpeted its genocidal intent to eradicate the Jews. I beseech you to be invited to accord Israel the same right to eliminate Hamas without condemnation to civilian casualties. That is a tragic but inevitable, inevitable result of any war. Today, I ask of you from the bottom of my heart to stand strong with Israel and to stay true to your father's most profound teachings with heartfelt appreciation, Bernie Brandman. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, 
this concludes the program for this press conference. A number of us will be headed over to the White House to deliver uh, the letters. Uh, many others will be shipped to the White House. Um, and um, we will continue our advocacy at the Orthodox Union. Um, we hope we don't have to reach another milestone day as we have today with day number 180. Um, but we will continue our advocacy with the entire American Jewish and pro-Israel community to urge the president and his team to stand strong in support of Israel's battle against the evil Hamas, to bring the hostages home, and to keep all American Jews safe, and to combat vigorously the surge of anti-Semitism. We can take hope and inspiration from the Pesach holiday that Rachel goldberg Polin referred to earlier today. It is ultimately a message of hope and redemption, and it is a message that was very resonant with the founders of the United States of America, which is why the Jewish community here has found such a blessed country to live in and to flourish in, and we hope that that message of redemption will suffuse the thinking of the president and his team in these important days ahead, and we will keep up the fight to let our people go, bring them home, and to enable Israel to vanquish Hamas. Thank you all for joining us today.